Welcome to Cartoonist Cafe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. This is a very, very fun thing. I've been wanting to dig into this for weeks, Ed, the Mirage Mini Comics box set. But before we do, point people at some stuff. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor is where I'm serializing my Red Room uh, comic strip at this very moment. Um, we're into issue two right now, put new strips up every Tuesday. Three bucks get you the archive. Issue one is up there, available to read now. And it's for the early adopters, for the people who want to check out the comic ahead of uh, everybody else, because it'll see a print edition uh, in the uh, in the future next year. Um, the X-Men Grand Design Omnibus is sold out, but it could, it's still available in some shops on Amazon or whatever. So I figured, why not use the power of kayfabe and uh, sell out the Ed Piscor Studio Edition? If it's not in your shop, which it probably ain't, like they don't, it's the rare comic shop that's just holding uh, a bunch of hundred hundred dollar books. But um, Fanagraphics.com, get this for a steep discount and uh, let's make artist, that disappear. Artist editions are a bad thing to have to, to find once they're out of print because these are not right. often reprinted. <laughs> yep. All right. I want to draw everyone's attention to my latest two books. These came out late last year and early this year. Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive is available from Image Comics, wherever comics and books are sold. This collects all of my Image Comics, as well as a couple of Street Angel stories that weren't uh, published anywhere, just as many comics that I made. But 240 pages, full color, Homeless Ninja on a Skateboard. This is perfect for any comics reader. Uh, the Plain Janes, my young adult graphic novel with Cecil Castellucci. 500-page epic about these outcasts in high school who kind of find each other in this little suburban town and start making public art to entertain themselves. And, of course, before you know it, that draws the ire of their classmates as well as the local cops and gets into a whole big story of their high school adventures making art in the streets. Off the jump, dude, I got to commend you on just like the quality that your box is still in because I've, <laughs> I've, I've never seen it in uh, su such a good quality. And the one that I bought was, I bought it a long time ago and it was banged up even then. Where'd you get yours, Ed? Phantom of the Attic. Three Phantom of the Attics ago. I often remember where my comics come from. I've had this in the collection for a long time and don't remember where I found it. And it's an odd object. 1989, as you mentioned the box, this is a... All these comics came in this little container. Mirage, obviously Kevin Eastman, Peter Laird's Turtles Company. And uh, I wondered, like, going through this, what sparks this? Obviously, many comics have been around. And I was thinking Scott McCloud, because McCloud was in Northampton area, and he was writing a mini columns column for Amazing Heroes in the 86, 87 time period. So probably passing around some cool stuff that he would find. Um, I also saw a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles mini comic from, I think, the year before that came like through their fan club. So I don't know what sparks this exactly, but wow, it's awesome because it's all of the guys that were kind of part of the Turtles. You know, you'd see fill in issues and things. They're all contributing here. And those names include Jim Lawson, Eric Talbot, obviously Eastman and Laird, uh, the Puma Blues guys, Steve Murphy and, and um, Mike Zuli, Mike Dooney, Steve Bissett, Mark Martin, Rick Veach. It's incredible. Mark Boudet. These are great. This is a collection of some very talented cartoonists contributing these things. So I figure we'll just start flipping through them. But these are traditional mini comic sizes. So that four and a quarter by five and a half. And most of them are eight pages, which is the traditional mini comic because it's one sheet of printer paper. Yeah. Cut in half, stapled in the middle, you get eight pages. And uh, starting out here with Jim Lawson. It's almost the opening to a cartoon. This would be like your credits, where this biker and his pal, this egg-looking shape, are riding down the road, come around a bend, wreck into a truck that has, you know, some kind of chemical... Could be the chemicals that once gave the turtles their mutation. These guys, uh, it, it, whose, whose names you, you might not quite recognize be, beyond uh, Mirage Studios, uh, one of the cool things about those dudes is they were with Eastman and Laird, like, through, through the run for a, a big for a long time and if you watch stuff like the turtle power documentary like they have a hand in designing like the, the action figures and, sh and shit like that man so they're they're ro they're rooted and entrenched with uh mirage eric talbot and kevin eastman One doing melting pot which seems like it's been around damn near as long as the turtles bisley yeah. comes on board at one point yeah i feel like this is probably like the first time it pops up or something man and, and talbot was my he's my steve he's a platt. badass he's my stephen platt of of the mirage studios i i, I really dig his work specifically of this period of time. This is your post-apocalyptic setting. Reminded me of uh, Fist of the North Star. I was thinking on the way over what some of these are like. So you have your uh, your main melting pot protagonist, I guess, showing up and saying, I'm death. You know, this is post-apocalyptic. And, uh, and they detail what this world is. But uh, then the guy he's fighting is also death. 
he's the last of his race, so he sh he cannot fail. And let's fight to the death. So that's what you have in this comic. Yeah, it's definitely shades of where Eastman's going to go in the future. Cutting a dude in half. And you can see why I'd be like, yeah, bring Bisley on. But this is just uh, like kid power fantasy stuff. Dig it. That's what they do. I, I would have been totally on board with this in 1989. And, and I'm not too far off board with it now. Mark Baudet. Yeah, becomes a tattoo artist, a really good graffiti artist, and you can see him employing all of that energy. In this story, they're doing graffiti, these characters, these cartoon-like characters, doing graffiti, getting caught, and then doing some like cartoon character escape tricks where they climb on their shoulders and swing away to get away from the cops that are trying to stop their graffiti crimes. Did, did a couple good uh, Ninja Turtles comics and was known for uh, Miami Mice, his... Uh, I, no, rip, known rip for off, it? Rip-off press. Well, you could find those things. <laughs> yeah, in I see a lot of them. Yeah, for sure. One of the uh, the turtle knockoffs. This is a strange one. This is car very cartoony, you know, uh, Atlantic City. Very cartoony. I didn't get a ton out of this stuff until you get to this last page where you see, like, what they're railing against, which is Trump. <laughs> very timely for 1989. I feel like this one could have come out today. Um, kind of different. Not my favorite, but interesting for that reason. And it does make me think about Trump and Atlantic City and how close that was to uh, WrestleMania. Several WrestleManias were done in those Trump Towers in Atlantic City. WrestleMania 4, man. So kind of kind of interesting to see that. I was surprised to see that flipping you know, flipping through these. Here's one for you. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures. This is a uh, like a lost turtle story. And this is by the guys who were doing the TMNT adventure comic. Mm -hmm. And so you go through... Basically, Cowlick, this head, is transporting them to different places. One of them is a future that's apparently terrible, which makes me curious to read the original comic and see what that future looks like. Because this is 1989. Like, their future, 2020 is pretty far in the future, you know? Uh, and it's really fun because they say where this appears. It takes place between the first and second panels of page 27 of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures 7. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> pretty fun. Again, this whole box set is hard to explain. <laughs> Here's Gizmo. Do you know Gizmo? Oh, yeah, yeah. I got every issue. Is this is this Michael Dooney? Michael Dooney. Michael Dooney, probably one of his most famous pieces is a cover for reprint of issue number four, which became the sticker label for the NES game. Oh, you know, so wow, it's like yeah. all the red label, all the, all the red bandanas, man. Like that image, I consider it to be pretty iconic. For sure. And so his painting skills are dope. This is a lot of, you know, duo shade in most of these. Mm -hmm. Really dig seeing that. And these are, you know, Gizmo's, this robot that's kind of a very lively personality, sitting down and talking to this old-timey robot who's like a minor robot. Yeah, he's... Uh, minor like a digger, not like a lesser character. Right. Because uh, Gizmo, I think he's like space truckers is the, is the deal. Yeah, so kind of fun. I, another one that I don't know Gizmo, like I've seen that, that logo and stuff, but I haven't read any of those. This is fun. This is, well, this is the opposite of fun. Let me, let me be more descriptive. <laughs> Stephen Murphy, dude, is the opposite of fun. He is doing environmental comics at this time called Puma Blues with Michael Zuli. He's the writer. And so this is kind of a collage of his of writing and found stuff. It's very uh, politically active, I guess. It reminds me of whenever we were looking at Flex and, and little Wally Sage gets drug into like the anti-war zines and anti-atomic bomb zines, the comics from hell zines that he calls them. Yeah. That's what this is. Totally. Because I'm reading this and I mean, this is about poaching and it's just devastating. Really horrible shit to read. And then you think like, well, geez, you know, do I shield myself from this? We're aware of poaching being a problem and ivory hunters and stuff. But it just felt really gruesome to read this. And it feels like this has been kind of pushed away from the front page of the newspaper, so to speak. You know, I was aware of poaching. This is a very graphic kind of depiction of it. And I feel like that's outside the mainstream news. And it, it's different now, maybe. I, well, maybe not. Maybe those animals are extinct. Right. Anyway, <laughs> harsh stuff. Uh, you know, definitely like that political kind of zine. I don't, I don't even know how to describe this one. Who's the creators of this one? Uh, let's see. Mark Martin. So, Nat Rat. Good cartoonist. Spent a lot of time at Tundra. Uh, one of the early employees at Tundra. So, smart guy. Good cartoonist. Technically uh, savvy. And he has this character named Lasagna. <laughs> who is dream dating with Donatello. And very one-sided. This is all her talking, talking, talking him up. 
and then we uh, we get the gag. He was an inflatable, kind of like a, uh, think of a, a really primitive sex doll or something, and gets deflated. So I'm glad those Mirage boys finally decided to license adult toys. That's funny, man. Yeah. <laughs> Blow up Love Turtle. He's the first guy to, to jump on board and do an issue of Turtles that wasn't Eastman and Laird. So that's worth noting. All right. Uh, Puma Blue. So we're back with Stephen Murphy, you know, writer, but Michael Zuli artwork. It's so good. You know, like visually, so you can see even from the cover, like it stands out as being exceptionally attractive. You know, a different, more illustrative illustri- uh, approach to comics drawing. And this is, I don't know, it's a it's a plug for Puma Blues. You know, like this isn't giving away anything, I don't think. It's not an integral chapter or revelation, but it's kind of, I think, trying to advertise Puma Blues for you. You know, it's this environmental story. He's feeding fossil fuel to a rhinoceros to kind of, I don't know, at least give you some idea of what's at stake here. I believe this story was set slightly in the future at the time, and it was pretty much about environmental collapse and maybe the powers behind that. It involved some media stuff, but beautiful art. Yeah, great and look drawing. at how big it is. You can see the duotone on this, and it's bigger. Makes me think so, that he drew it to size. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm thinking. You know, the lettering's very big, so that's probably what you're seeing here is drawn on a page or two of... Uh, you know, actual size and then just reprinted here, which, hey man, real fun to flip through. Very good looking book. Yeah. Yeah. His man, he draws. Out. You know, like just seeing that's markers, you know, you can kind of see the way the edges of those lines are. Yeah. You bleed a bit. It's very telling to be able to see that kind of uh, art for a guy like him who's making art that doesn't look like anything else. Uh, Rick Veach's Little Tiny Comics, number one, King Hell Press. Looks so good. The King Hell logo on the back of that. Yeah. I think this was uh, reprinted elsewhere. This appeared in Heavy Metal. Oh, Two okay, of these, great, yeah. So this, he did four of these, and, and here's your history of it. But he did four of these strips, and it was when Heavy Metal first launches in the U.S., and they're, you know, they're doing other comics. It's not just reprints of like those classic European guys. And Veach and his contemporaries, I think, all jumped at that. Yeah. And so the first thing he did were, I think they would run in like the letters pages and stuff. So he did four of these little tiny comics that could be used there. And uh, this reprints two of those. And always inventive. You know, just a cartoonist cartoonist. There's something that happens like when you have a bunch of cartoonists together kind of like on the come up and you have a crew. You don't want to be the odd man out. You don't want to be the whack one. So it's iron sharpens iron. You got to keep rocking. You got to keep working hard. You got to impress one another, man. Just from a practical standpoint, like you can't be as good as the guy that's being published because that guy already has the connection. You have to be better than what's out there if you want to make your name, if you want to get, you know, get these opportunities. And I feel like <laughs> Veach and Bissett, those guys came out of Kubert School, man, firing their asses. And I mean, even before that, he was doing two fisted funnies. Like you think of his body of work, and it's phenomenal. Uh, apologies to Henry Miller. A lot of the text is taken from Tropic of Cancer. It's a pretty interesting, you know, as a standalone mini comic. Um, these two are somewhat interchangeable, or, or a pair, I shouldn't say interchangeable, but this is Peter Laird and Bissett teaming up. And so Bissett does the art here, and I guess, I don't know if they co write or figure out these characters, but basically the Commandosaurs and the Pterosaurs are two different groups of these dinosaurs that are at war with each other. And I'm going to note the full moon from now on every time <laughs> I see it anywhere. Uh, these are, these remind me of like, we're pitching to our turtles reps. This yeah. is another wave of like characters that could be cartoons and toys and all of that stuff. For sure, they're armed dinosaurs that are fighting other armed dinosaurs. Yeah, and this was the era. I mean, there's dinosaurs for hire. There's you know Jurassic Park is impending. They were trying to make that movie for a million years. And we know Bissett loves dinosaurs, of course. And so does Peter Laird. It's, it's so. a perfect tandem. Yeah, these these are really kind of uh, these are fun. These are these could fit easily in that turtle. That is so cool. Toy man. model. Yeah, really great. Do you think they're collaborating? I mean, that, that they, has yeah, definitely. Bissett's, you know, they must have been collaborating art and writing. Yeah, for sure. And and Bissett helped out on I think it was Leonardo number one. Um, so you know he was connected with these dudes. And then finally a Casey Jones story. And I was trying to figure out your timeline here because this is Eastman and Laird. And does it come after Turtles 11, you know, 89? When did they wrap up their, you know, when did they get overwhelmed and just be done doing their Turtle collaboration? That's a good, that's a good question. So possibly this is maybe the last Eastman Laird for a couple decades. 
Uh, but it's classic. It looks just like a Turtles issue because it's the guys who did Turtle. It's on that duo shade paper. You get some fun money shots. And this is all like a Casey Jones uh, dream that he's having. But also the template for, uh, you know, what the Turtles series would become, where it was like different interpretations of the characters. So in this case, he's a hard PI that's at odds with the Turtles, kind of a gangster era story. Yeah, that's Until cool. he wakes up. And then it's, it's back to work. 89, huh? Gotta, gotta help clean out the barn, Casey. Get off your ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is probably the first kind of weird object I got, uh, like a... I mean, it is comics, but it's like the first like kind of weird, odd-shaped kind of comics I ever uh, got my hands on. Certainly on the strength of Turtles themselves and uh, reading the Mirage Turtles. This would be advertised in there. So like when this popped up at Phantom, I mean, they they, they had it there probably since 1989. And I got mine like 92, 93 uh, for those re for those reasons, man, just because it's associated with you know this company I love. This might have been something I tracked down online, like once you know eBay and and my comic shops and Mile High Comics. I used to order from them a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I may have gotten this from something online. Like I heard about it, had no idea where to find one. Found one somewhere online and ordered it. Something like that. Strange object. Pretty hefty price tag too. I think for 1989, 12 bucks for. You know, a pretty small package. Yeah. That's kind of surprising to me. Um, at at, uh, at Phantom of the Attic, uh, you would spend 10 bucks and you would get what they would call Dollaros. And yes, yeah. Do you remember the Dollaros? I do. And so, like, what the Dollaros were, they just printed up a bunch of fake money with, like, Jack Kirby was the center, like, the George Washington, put their own stamp on it so that you can't kayfabe your own Dollaros. And so every 10 bucks you spend, you get a Dollaro. And... You know, when I spent a hundred bucks or whatever, it was it was like eight dollars. I remember because um, it's like the most money I ever spent on some comics. But just got them with dollars because the expense was a little more than I was used to. I do love this. You know, I, I got it early enough where I was into mini comics, and it was kind of like this is how guys who had polish, had experience, had the skills. You know, like that high level of craft applied to the mini comics format. Yeah, and uh, the 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 funny thing though is. Um, Mirage Studios, kind of a big deal, good cartoonists and everything. So they had to like offset print these mini comics, which which uh, sort of disobeys the the true beauty of the mini comic, where it's like you could just at this time uh, you could go to like the Seven um, Eleven or whatever, and for like one penny get a get a Xerox. So for like two pennies front and back, that would be the cost of your comic, you know. Super yeah, cool. and these are not pioneering mini comics. You know, mini comics had, had risen really with the rise of the uh, of the photocopy machine in the late seventies. Is whenever I think this format started to gain a lot of momentum. Yeah, and there are examples even predating that. And if you wanted to go all the way back, Tijuana Bibles are essentially a version of this back into the twenties and thirties. So they didn't invent this format, but it is very popular. You know, and and like I said, in the eighties there was a vein of guys. Matt Fizell was up and running. You know, throughout the eighties with these things, kind of the king of the of the minis. So. Pretty neat. It does feel like the profit margin on this had to be steep because these things are costing not very much to produce. Sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say, Jim Bounce? Yes. All right, man. K favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when the next vids are available. Uh, it's the holiday season and we got a bunch of books in stores right now. So Jim's got uh, the Street Angel Image Collection, the Street Angel Hardcover Collection that is out of print. So if it's in the shop, you better scoop it up quick. Uh, Plain James is out there. Octobriana's out there. And he sold that out too, right? From from your level? We're not quite out of that. Okay. But man. close. You're getting close. Uh, Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor is where I'm serializing my Red Room comic strip for the early adopters. Three bucks for the archive on that. X-Men Grand Design Omnibus sold out at our level, man. So get it while supplies last in the shops if you see it. And uh, we're in the process of selling out the uh, Ed Piscor Studio Edition. Uh, go to fanographics.com for a big discount on that. Yeah, make that sellout happen. Yeah. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. I encourage you all to do that to keep up with everything that we do, what we post, because you don't catch everything through the uh, social media follows, although follow us there as well. Those links below here. And finally, you can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. One more set of Martian orders, Jimmy. We'll be on our way. Read more mini-comics.